Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome back this uh, new year. Um, look forward to starting a new year with you. Bible studies. Good to see you all here, by the way. Thanks for uh, who brought the desserts again? I'm sorry. Yeah. Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, she did. And thanks, uh, ladies. Thanks for setting up, and thanks for helping my wife and Rachel set up. Those of you who did, I appreciate that. Um, Sherry, hey, happy new year to you too. Uh, I sent out before we get started. Well, let me get started in a word of prayer. I guess we should. Lord, thank you, Almighty God. We come before you today, realizing, Lord, that all is by, all is gift, all is by grace. Uh, that we've not earned anything, but that you've looked down upon us with mercy, loving kindness, and grace, and you have showered your grace upon us today by giving us just a few minutes, Lord, during the day, the work day, to look at your word, your truth, uh, and to make us into the people you always intended us to be. Help us to apply this to our lives and to our families, and we thank you for the food that you've provided for us also your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I sent out this, uh, if you didn't get it, let me, if you're not on my uh, distribution list, let me know, but this is my personal mission statement that I sent to you, and what it is is, uh, who is it? Yogi Berra, I think it once said, if you don't know where you're going, any direction, any direction will get you there, or something like that, and uh, some people are like that in their life, they really, remember how when I told you before, some people live from one accomplishment to the next, that's all they're doing. <coughs> They, they're thinking about their next accomplishment, and then when they're done with that, they think about the next. They really don't have an end game in mind. It's just a series of accomplishments. And hopefully through these accomplishments, your boss or your work you, will give you the satisfaction you're looking for as far as being part of something or being significant. And so instead of looking to the Lord for your significance, you look to your spouse or your uh, employment for significance. And remember we told you about, uh, what was it, uh, the bet? The Frank Besson principle, is that what it was? Yes. And I asked you who that was, and none of you knew. It's the first commander of AMC, and so you'll soon be forgotten, in other words. Uh, but God will never forget about you. If you have a personal mission statement, though, every day you think about it, you look at it, it keeps you on, keeps you on target because you have a tendency to go off target. Uh, an airplane flies. Airplane, where's, uh, <laughs> I got a pilot in here. Airplane doesn't fly exactly straight from point A to point B. It's always making course corrections, especially if it's on autopilot. You just don't notice it, but it's making small course corrections. This helps you to make small course corrections. And uh, so my mission in life is to know God. That's, that's what I want to do, just to know him. And, and then I break it down. What does that mean? I, to know him by knowing about him, uh, studying the scriptures, and uh, spending time with him, and then allowing him to live in love through me reproducing the same in others, all for the purpose of glorifying him. So that's my, and then I break it down into three uh, global purposes here. So I just put, I gave that to you because I know, you know, sometimes we do, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, the first of the year uh, resolutions, you know, and you want to start something new. I think that's something, that's admirable to do, to, to have a personal mission statement, to know where you're going. So last, uh, two weeks ago, we didn't have this, we, we, uh, we uh, went over um, the soul's paradox of love. If you remember, that was um, uh, A.W. Tozer, who once said the great paradox, the great paradox of our soul uh, is to have found God and to still seek him. And so and we talked about how bi- books of the Bible are set up in this way, that normally the first half of it uh, is about coming, how to come to God, and the second half is how to uh, walk with God. And so Leviticus is like that. Remember the first few chapters about how to approach him, and then the last few chapters about how to walk with him. All of Paul's epistles are like this. And so this is our job to, to have found it. But really, we didn't find him. We didn't find him. What happened? He found us, right? And so, um, in fact, that's what religion is: mankind, mankind seeking after God. Um, biblical. I'll say the biblical Christianity, as far as the Christian doctrines go, is about God seeking after us. It's, a, it's completely turned around there. It's a relationship. It's a relationship, exactly. Not, not a religion, but a relationship. He wants our best. We talked about that. I talked about how does God see us, if you remember, in his image and those other ideas. Uh, what this does, 
if you look how God sees us and, and, and you break it down like I had on the slide, it helps you to understand how, what you look like in God's eyes. And so helps you reach that fourth degree of love I was talking about before, loving yourself as God loves you. It's easy to love yourself the way you want to love yourself, but you really have to know the scriptures to love yourself the way God loves you. And so it's, it's a total different way of seeing it. And finally, we talked about the ungrateful biped that uh, Dostoevsky, I think his name is, the Russian novelist, called a human. Because gratitude has the shortest half-life of all disciplines. Now, why would I call gratitude a spiritual discipline? Like prayer, uh, reading the scriptures, meditation, fellowship, you know, these are spiritual disciplines. Why would gratitude be a spiritual discipline? Give thanks. Why, but why would that be a spiritual discipline? Keep you humble. Because, why? because we don't do it. Exactly. It's, it's a spiritual discipline because we don't do it. In fact, here's a way, if you want to know what humans are really like, Take all the commands in the Bible. Whenever you see a command that we're supposed to do, reverse it. And that's what we're like. Because that's a good indication. Because we don't, gratitude quickly turns into what? Entitlement. Uh, it's, it's soon, really fast, it turns into entitlement. Jesus healed 10 lepers. And remember the story? How many came back to thank One. him? One came back to thank him. And so, um, it's, it's good in the morning when I get up, the first thing I do, I start thanking God. Just yeah. the fact that I'm up. I have a warm house, a job. Uh, he's really blessed me and, and showered grace upon me and my family. I thank him for this. I never let that forget me. I will, I'm will. i just scratching the surface. I will never know what he's done for me, actually. Right, right. Um, because he went, because think about it. All the saints in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, I'm talking about Paul and, and Peter and those, and uh, Stephen and others, when they knew they were about to die, they were kind of looking forward to it, weren't they? But when Jesus was about to die, what happened? He, he sweat great drops of blood, and he asked the Father, if there's any other way, let it be. Apparently, he did something for us so horrible that we will never know, that even he didn't want to do it. I mean, he was looking for another way, and he did it. He suffered for us, not just physically on the cross, but some other way we'll never know. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so uh, we'll never know what he did for us, I don't think. There's a, there's a song. Uh, I'll never know what your love was or something. Anyway. What it cost to see my sins. Yeah. That's the one. I'll never know what it cost to see yeah. my sins. That's the one. So uh, we're in Genesis 18, 14 now. And uh, there's two <laughs> angels talking with Abraham and Sarah. Bring you up a day here. Genesis 18, 14, two, two angels, and they're, they're going, they have a couple of things they're going to do. Uh, first, they're going to tell them, yeah, Sarah's going to have a child about this time next year. Of course, she's, uh, I think, 90, past childbearing age. And then she, when she hears about it, what does she do? She laughs. And what does the, uh, the, the name Isaac mean? Laughter. So, so every time they called Isaac in from playing out in outside, they had to remember, oh, yeah, that's right, because we laughed. Uh, when they told us we were going to have a child. So 1814, um, so the Lord said to Abram, this is 13, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? And then 14 says, is anything too hard for the Lord? No. At the, no, it's good. At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But then Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. <laughs> uh, and so it, then it goes on to, so, what, what is it? Is anything too hard for the Lord? That is a good scripture to memorize. Now, here's what happens. In your own life, you are bombarded with cultural uh, norms that are countercultural to the Bible. For instance, through education, through media, and through entertainment, you are constantly bombarded and told that this life is, is most important Fix your eyes upon this life and this world and think in physical things. Don't think about the next life. Just think about the next accomplishment to keep you busy. And uh, constantly is always trying to, to twist things and, and trying to uh, trick you into thinking that this is what's most important right here on this, this earth. Um, so what happens is you have to go to Scripture on a regular basis to overcome that. Otherwise, you will buy in to the uh, philosophy of this world. You really will. And this is why you really need to stay in here. 
uh, Genesis 18, 40, is anything too hard for the Lord? And so when you start these scriptures, when you start going over them in your mind, you will understand there is a God who can do anything and nothing is impossible with him. And it, it, gives, you cal- it gives you a sense of calmness or peace. Um, the bigger your God, the smaller your problem. And of course, the uh, opposite is true too. The smaller your God, the bigger your problems. Um, Jeremiah, and here are some scriptures that I want to read to you to illustrate what I'm talking about. This is Jeremiah 32, 17. Jeremiah says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Numbers 11, 21 to 23. But Moses said, um, this is when God was telling Moses, I'm going to feed everybody here. Remember the quail? Or, yeah, I think it was quail. But Moses said, here I am among 600,000 men on foot. And you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month? Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish of the sea were caught for them? This is Moses talking to God. And then God comes back and says, is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true for you. God does that for us sometimes too, doesn't he? When we don't believe him, he says, you wait, you watch me. Watch what I can do in your life. Because there's nothing impossible for me. <clears throat> That's just a comforting thought to me. Isaiah 59, 1. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Anybody know what the next verse, the next verse goes? But your sins have separated you from him, and your iniquities have, hit, have made him hide his face from you. <laughs> so it's, it's not that he's, it's not, he's not the problem. <laughs> We're the problem, right? Um, so... Uh, yeah, he can do anything. Matthew nineteen twenty six. Jesus looked at them and said, "With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible." Luke one thirty seven. For no word from God will ever fail. And then finally Exodus fourteen thirteen. Uh, when when the people were pushed against the Red Sea and the uh, Pharaoh's army were were uh, right at their back and they didn't have. I mean, they were between a brick and a hard place. Uh, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. So these are some scriptures that you need to go over in your mind to remind yourself if you're having problems, if there's problems in your marriage or at work or with money um, or just in, in any kind of general problem at all, you need to know that he can fix this. He can overcome anything, and nothing's impossible for him. And so that's why he wants you to come to him. Lay all your cares on him because he cares for you. That's First Peter 5, 8, by the way. Cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. I think that's First Peter 5, 8. Uh, and then, let's see, was that the last thing? Yeah, I guess it is. So, then in Genesis, uh, and then on in verse 19, let's move on just a little bit here. The Lord said, uh, you know, shall I hide Abraham what I'm going to do? And since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And then verse 19, God talks about Abraham. He says, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Um, and so... Here is a good indication, and I like to stop at these to, to remind myself throughout the Bible that God is really big on men taking the lead in the home and uh, be the spiritual leader in the home. Men really need to do this. And so God is telling Abraham, I know him, that he will command his family and his children after him to follow the ways of the Lord. Um, I, and he, God had, had trust that Abraham was going to do this. And so what are some other scriptures? Well, Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, bring up your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. It's important to do this. Um, Joshua 24, 15, one of uh, probably a verse that many of you could quote. Uh, when, uh, when, when Joshua was, they're about to, uh, they're in the land, they had taken over the land for the most part, and Joshua said, now, you can go out there and worship Baal if you want to, or you can worship God. That's your choice. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, um, Joshua 24, 15. So that was his choice. He was going to lead his family to worship and serve the Lord. First Kings 1, 6. So what I started doing, these last two scriptures, well, I don't know, a few years ago, I started looking, what is it that caused, I did a study on good boys from bad fathers and bad boys from good fathers. The, the, uh, 
the bad boy, the, the good boys from bad fathers, it was a very short list. Uh, you know, Hezekiah was the son of, uh, was it Manasseh? I forgot. I think it was. Or maybe the other way around, but it was like it went from it went from worst to, uh, best to worst in one generation. And so I found out I went through this list, and I can send that to you if you want to, of uh, good fathers who had bad sons. And what I found were two scriptures in there. This is First Kings one six, where the scripture was talking about Adonijah, one of David's sons, and it says his father had never interfered with him by asking, why do you behave as you do? Simply just getting in their face, go, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? There's a lot of fathers that just won't do this. A lot of mothers won't do it. Uh, parents, just simply just find out, what are you looking on Facebook here? What, what are you, what's, what's going on? Why, why is this happening to you in school? You know, Just a simple question. But a lot of times we don't want to get involved. And then the other was 1 Samuel 3.13, where Eli's two sons, I think it was Hophni and Phinehas, is that his two sons, I think? They were, Eli was a priest, he had two sons who were priests, and they, would, they were really wicked priests. Uh, and the scripture says, his sons made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain them, the scripture said. So here's two illustrations of fathers, really good fathers, who... Uh, did not get involved in the lives of their children right here. And you can see what happened. So um, that's why it's, and that's why God told Abraham here, I know that he will command his children and his family after him. Um, so let's move on now. Any questions, comments about that? Okay. So going on to verse 23. Uh, now these two guys, they're about to reveal something to Abraham that they're going to do to where Lot is living, just uh, southeast from where Abraham was, at the southeast corner of the Dead Sea. And these two, guys, these two angels are going, God is going to destroy this place. Sodom is the name of the place. And um, let's read it. And so uh, this is verse 21. I will go down now and see whether they have done all together. Well, I'll start at verse 20. The Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the man turned away and there and he went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Now, Abraham and Moses are two good examples of how you can actually, and I'm going to, I'm going to call it haggle with God. That's what they do. They're haggling with God. And they're going, uh, well, what about, and I'm going to read it to you right here. So the man turned away, and Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that ran it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? I mean, that's pretty serious, isn't it? I don't know. You, you wouldn't do that, would you, God? I mean, you're going to do right, and you're not going to destroy that place if there's... 50 righteous. And God said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Abraham comes back and says, what about 40? And God says, I'll do it for 40. <laughs> or how about 30? So he's, he's basically haggling with God is what he's doing. He gets them down to, I think, what? How many? One, I think. I was speaking. I'm not doing five, 30. Let's see. 20, 10. Yeah, 10. 10. I will not destroy for the sake of ten. So the Lord went his way. Notice God, God took off after ten. He said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not sticking around for this much. Money. As soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. If he could just find, we know how the story goes, he couldn't find ten. And, they, and God destroyed the place. Um, we are supposed to be salt and light. Matthew 5.13, the scripture says, um, how does it go, Matthew 5.13? Huh? Say it again. Yeah, I forgot the scripture. It says, uh, anyway, you are the salt of the earth. And if the salt has lost its taste or its uh, what's it? savor, then it's no good to be used anymore. You know what that means? If the salt becomes like everything else, no seasoning. No seasoning. It does, it's, why use it? So if we become like the rest of the world and act and live like them, and if we are molded by the 
culture around us and we become like them, we're no, we're no good for his service at that point. He can't really use us. Um, and so he wants us to be different. He wants us to be salt. He wants us to be light, uh, different, to stand out. Believers are to confront culture, not adapt to it. Amen. When Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, in John 17, he was praying, and he said, he's, he was going, Lord, I know I'm about to leave this place. I know you're about to take me back up with you again. But, I'm, but these that you have given to me, I, I'm going to leave, the, we're going to leave them here. And, but they need to understand this is not their home. Yes. John 17, 16 they are of the world, but they're in the world, but they are not what? Of the world. Of the world. Exactly. And so we're supposed to confront. We're not of this world. We're of a different world. Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship is in heaven, actually. And we need to live, I'm going to teach you a word this morning. Some of you may know, proleptically. Proleptically means to live as, in your, as if you're already there. Yeah. In fact, did you know that's how God sees each, each person who is a believer who has uh, who, who has uh, been gone through the transformation process and trusted in His uh, Son? Did you know that God sees you as you will be, not as you are right now? He see, He's already forgiven your sins, past, present, future. He sees you as you will be. He as a glorified individual. That's why the past tense is used in Roman eight. Those He justified, He glorified. It's past tense. Isn't that weird? He's, he's looking at us proleptically, as we shall be, and I encourage you to live proleptically. Live like this is not your place, that you have another home. And it just it, it helps you to really put things in perspective here. You don't have to adapt to this. Ezekiel 16, 51. Remember I told you about that, that passage in Ezekiel 16 that was really graphic. What time is it saying? 26. Okay. <laughs> no, it's at 36. And that we're... Israel was actually worse than her. Israel had become worse than her sisters. God's, God calls her sisters Sodom and Samaria. If you see it, it, Ezekiel 16, he said, you actually worse than your sisters. And, and we know that Sodom and Samaria were pretty bad. That's what happens when you fail to make him number one in your life. You will start going after the gods of this world. They went after Baal. Ashtaroth and all those other gods, we go after the God of uh, money, the God of employment. So for some people, this is their God here. They worship their job. Uh, you know, other gods. It's no different than it was back then. That's why you have to make this a part of your life every day to overcome the bombardment of everything else that comes through your television, through movies, through education, and through media. And then finally, Ezekiel 14, 14. I mean, Israel got so bad that God said, even if Samuel, Moses, Noah, Daniel, or Job were to stand before God, and, and, uh, and in the place of Israel, his heart would not be with Israel. I mean, that was pretty bad, all those guys. <laughs> so, salt of the earth. I wrote something else down here. Oh, yes. Haggling with God. Yeah. I wrote, uh, I didn't put these in the slides, but I can send them to you if you want to. Here's some other instances of haggling with God. Uh, one was Abraham and Sodom. That's Genesis 18. We just went over that. Another was Exodus 32, 9 through 14, where God was about to destroy Israel and start all over again. I'll, I'll just stop. These guys are worshiping a golden calf. I just brought them out of Egypt. I'm just going to do away with them. I'm going to destroy them and make a new nation out of you. And Moses said, look, now don't do this. Let me... Let me try to fix this. Don't do, I mean, really, he, haggling with God. Let me fix this. Take my name out of the book, but not theirs. And God said, I'm not going to take your name out of the book. But you go down there and fix that. He did. Uh, and then Isaiah 38, 1 through 6. Anybody remember the story of Hezekiah when he was told he was going to die? What did he do? He turned his back and he prayed. Oh, God, haven't I? I've, I mean, I've done this. I've done that. I, I've tried to be good for you. God said, and and and. After Isaiah had told Hezekiah he's going to die, he left. As Isaiah was walking out the door, almost outside the palace, God said, no, turn around, tell him I'm going to give him how many more years? <laughs> 15 more years, right? He said, I've seen your tears. I've heard your prayer. I'm going to give you another 15 years. Now, the bad thing is right after that, Hezekiah invited uh, the king of, I want to say Babylon, to come look at all of his riches and everything. And then 
And then Isaiah came back and said, what did you just do? I showed, the, I showed the king of Babylon all our riches and stuff. Okay. Well, <clears throat> you basically you showed our enemy where all of our defenses and everything else was, so they're going to take everything now. Um, but anyway, that's haggling. Another, and then another one was, oh, this is great, in Deuteronomy 3, 23. I have to read this to you. Moses had this special, and I'm going to finish with this. Deuteronomy 3, 23. Moses had this special relationship with God that I wish I had, and I wish every one of you had. And you can just talk to him like this. Uh, God had already told Moses, um, now you you messed up at the rock of Meribah when, when I told you to speak to the rock so that water could come out of it and the people could drink. And Moses says, I loved what Moses said there. He said, he got really angry. Moses' um, primary flaw was anger. He got angry real fast. And he, he told the people, shall we bring water from this rock? I love that. Shall we? I bet God was going, we? <laughs> Who is we? <laughs> Who is we? You're not bringing anything to that rock. That's me, Moses. But Moses is, and then he struck the rock. Remember, God told him to speak to the rock, but he struck. He's just angry. And God said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and give him water. But just so you know, because of that, because you dishonored me in front of the people, you know, you don't get to go into the promised land. Um, and then, it, so right before they're going into the promised land, this is great. Moses says this, listen. Uh, then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, Oh, Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth that can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond Jordan, those pleasant mountains in Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account. He's talking to the people and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. And he told them to go up to the top of Mount Pisgah. You can see where they're going, but you're not going to get to go. Now, in all actuality, in the New Testament, remember the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus went up there, do you remember who he appeared with? Yes. Moses. Moses and Elijah. Now, so if that, if that Mount of Transfiguration was in the Promised Land, I guess he did get to go there, didn't he? <laughs> uh, that's in Matthew 17 if you want to read about that, but that's just a side note. So any other uh, comments, questions about this? Um, <clears throat> anything at all? Yes. Uh, the parenting, I made me think of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, right after the Shema. Yes. It says, these commandments I give you today to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Hide them as symbols on your hands and buy them on your forehead. Yep. Have you ever seen a, uh, a um, traditional Jew... With a phylactery. That's the, that's, they're taking that, literally, they take the law of God and they make it real small. They put it on their head right there. It's a phylactery. Tie them to your forehead. Forehead and where else? Uh, your, your hands. Okay. So what you think and what you do should be governed by God is what he's trying to say there. And put it on your doorpost when you lay down and when you walk. Basically, it covers all aspects of life. And that's why I'm saying that this needs to... Fil this needs to filter through your entire life. Otherwise, the things of this world and Satan and your flesh, your, your flesh and the world conspire together to turn your attention away from God. Yeah. That's why you need this on a regular basis. It's a discipline. You never find yourself reading the Bible. You have to make time for it, you see. And so, um, all right, any other comments, questions? So what we'll do is uh, we'll meet again on the 14th of January. Uh, we'll pick it up at... Uh, I think Genesis 19, we'll talk about the destruction of Sodom, and uh, let's have a word for it. Lord, thank you now for your, your time again, and Lord, your, your word, your truth. Uh, help us, Lord, be salt in an otherwise bland world and light in an otherwise dark world, to not conform to the things of this world, but be transformed by your word so that we can be used by you, for ultimately for your glory, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.